Would you please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 110? Psalm 110. Ideas have consequences. And correct ideas or concepts are crucial. George Washington was 67 years old when he got a little throat infection. And the throat infection got worse. So the first doctor they called to come treat uh, the former president was a certified bleeder. And so he began to practice his work, and over time, a number of different doctors came to see him. But in a matter of 12 hours, 40% of his blood had been drained from him, and the president died. Ideas have consequences. Fast forward a number of decades, and Abraham Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater. They carried him across the street, laid him in the bed, and he didn't die instantly. He was alive all night long. And over the course of that night, Think of what hospitals do as far as hygiene and sterile environments and stuff. More than 90 visitors came into the president's room overnight. Many of them were doctors who all took a turn at trying to find the bullet in ab Lincoln's abdomen. Of course, he died. All that infection that was spread from person to person. Ideas have consequences. Wrong ideas have bad consequences. Right ideas have right consequences. Ideas have consequences. And that applies whether it's, we're thinking about medical uh, treatments, primitive or otherwise. That applies whether we're thinking about uh, gender identity. It applies whether we're thinking about marriage. It applies when we're thinking about God. Now, our culture has become absolutely obsessed with the idea that the self is the boss. Now, for many years in our culture, it was thought that a person would only thrive as they were in a community of people. A person only thrived as they were in a family and as they lived for the betterment of others. But that's not the case anymore. Our modern culture rejects that idea. Our culture says, be true to yourself. Our culture says, follow your own dreams. But ideas have consequences. And those that say, be true to yourself, then they can decide who they want to be and they decide what they are at any given time or moment. And then they demand that the community respect them and their decisions. They demand that the family recognize and honor, regardless of the impact of that thought process, of that idea, on the family. And in our culture today, the good of the group, the good of the family, is not even considered because the individual is held up as supreme. Ideas have consequences. Now, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were that legalistic crowd that loved to impose rules on other people. And they had some wrong ideas about who the Messiah was, the Christ. The word Messiah is the Hebrew word for the coming rescuer or savior that God had predicted. The Old Testament was penned in Hebrew, the Jewish dominant language. The New Testament was written in Greek, which was the common language of the day. And the Greek word for Messiah is the word Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, the Christ. And I'll use them today interchangeably. They're interchangeable words, the Messiah and the Christ. A.W. Tozer said it like this. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Ideas have consequences. And those Pharisees, that legalistic crowd back in Jesus' day, they thought that the promised Messiah would be a, a physical descendant of David. But they also thought incorrectly that that physical descendant of David would be merely a great man. They thought he would reign on a physical throne, and so they struggled when Jesus talked about his kingdom was in heaven. And they struggled after that Palm Sunday. They thought this was the moment he's going to rise up and throw off our physical oppressors. And he didn't do that. They didn't realize that he was the eternal God. 
that he was part of the Trinity, that he was planning a long purpose far beyond their immediate circumstance. The Pharisees needed to change their concept of who the Messiah was because they ended up rejecting the very Messiah they were looking for because their idea of what he would be like was wrong. So today we're going to talk about that view, but we're going to begin in Psalm 110. I want to read the psalm to you and then talk about why would we go to Psalm 110. Now, we're going there, first of all, because our series this summer is based on Messianic Psalms. The Anointed One is the word for Messiah or Christ. We studied the book of Hebrews in the spring, and Hebrews quoted so many different ones of the Psalms. And that's what's happening here. Psalm 110 is quoted in the book of Hebrews. If you want to follow along, verse 1 of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of the youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Why would we study Psalm 110? Why would this psalm matter so much? So I'm going to give you five reasons why we would study it, and then we'll take a closer look at the psalm itself. One reason we would study it is we would want to have a faith that perseveres, a faith that continues, a faith that is a long obedience in the same direction. Far too many people start out on some kind of good path or healthy path or they, they think they're following after God and then they fade. They get discouraged, they get distracted, they get disappointed. And if we want a faith that endures, this is a great place to start. Psalm 110, it's in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. We looked at this text a few months ago, but it says this, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Anybody's hope wavered this week? Anybody's hope wavered? Let's hang on tightly, grasp the confession of our hope. Not because you're strong, not because everything's working out your way, because he who promised is faithful. That's why we have a faith that endures. And Psalm 110 talks to us about God thinking about the timeline of history, not the little snapshot of life that happened in, to us this week. The second reason is if we want to hear God speak, we would be wise to study Psalm 110 we want to hear God speak. Now and then somebody will say, well, if God would just talk to me, if I could just hear from God, if he would just send me a message. <laughs> Look at how this psalm starts. The Lord said, oh, the Lord said. God has talked to us. And if we want to hear what God says, then we would get into this psalm and we would get into other places in Scripture. Another reason to study it uh, is if you want to know God's will, if you want to know God's will, you would get into Psalm 110. What do you cling to when your faith wavers? What is it you hang on to? We've talked here often that if we give up on God because our faith is wavering, you know, and our faith collapses and I'm going to give up on God, I'm going to walk away. Where do we go then? Where do we turn? What do we do when it starts to waver? Friends, uh, emotions, our family, a church, where do we go? Psalm 110 talks to us about God's grand eternal plan for human history. We're going to get into it when we take a closer look. 
But if we want to know what's going on around us and where do I fit in and what's my place and what's the meaning in my life and what's my identity, Psalm 110 is going to help us with that. It tells us that in eternity past, God the Father was communicating to God the Son, establishing a plan and purpose for human history. You know, another reason to study Psalm 110 is if you want to know what the New Testament writers are talking about. If you want to know what the New Testament writers are talking about. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. A couple different writers that I was looking at, uh, between 25 and 30 direct quotes, references, or allusions to this chapter are found in the New Testament. 25 or 30. There's just 27 books in the New Testament. So many, many times there's references back to this psalm that helps us make sense. I want to give you three of them just to give you some sense of things. One is in Matthew 22, and this text is used by Jesus to confound the Pharisees. It's used by Jesus to confound the, the Pharisees. And so let's take a look at Matthew 22. It's in verse 43 and 44. Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says, how does David in the spirit call him Lord? He was talking to those Pharisees and he says, now you all believe that the Messiah will come from the physical line of David. He's a descendant of David. But in Psalm 110, David calls him Lord. And so Jesus is saying to the, the, the legalistic crowd that's not accepting him, he's talking to people that aren't believing him, how does Jesus, how does David refer to this Messiah as Lord? Why would he call his son, his grandson, his great-great-grandson, Lord? He's trying to get him to think. So how does David in the spirit, letting us know that scripture came from the Holy Spirit, saying, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool. Look at the next verse that goes on, verse 45 and 46. If David calls him Lord, how is he also his son? And they, nobody could answer him a word, not that day, nor did anyone dare question him anymore. Those religious scholars couldn't answer the question Jesus put to them. And he, all he did was quote from Psalm 110 and verse 1. There's another time it's quoted. It's in Acts chapter 2 and verse 43 um, and through 46. And this is Peter's great sermon on Pentecost. Peter's great sermon on Pentecost. And he was wrapping up his sermon. He was drawing to the conclusion of his sermon. And he's trying to bring conviction into the hearts of the people. He's trying to preach toward conviction. In verse 34, he says this, David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He was trying to speak to that Jewish crowd to say this descendant of David is the Messiah. Uh, the next verse goes on, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, talking to a Jewish crowd, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord the boss and Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So it was Peter's intent to bring conviction by quoting from this text. This was God the Father talking about God the Son. He is God. Don't uh, misplace. He's the king. He's God. A third time it's used is in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13, and it confirms Jesus in his authority. In chapter 1 and verse 13, it's confirming, and the text goes like this, to which of the angels did Jesus ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool? God didn't say that to any of the angels, but he said it to the Son, Jesus Christ, Hebrews is all about making much of Christ. Hebrews is all about elevating Jesus Christ. That's been our goal here. If you want to study 
Psalm 110. There's some pretty good reasons to do that. A fifth reason why we would want to study Psalm 110, and that is if you want a faith as solid as David's. If you want a faith as solid as David's. Psalm 1 tells us there's a trinity. God the Father, God the Son are mentioned here. Psalm 110 talks to us about the incarnation of Christ that he took on human form. It tells us about the last judgment that will come to humanity. It tells us about the church we're going to see in a moment and the assembly of all of God's people, the believers together. It talks to us about eternal life. All wrapped up in this short little psalm, all of this declaration of faith. You could write a statement of faith, a personal declaration of faith based on what can be discovered in Psalm 110. So let's take a closer look. Verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So the first part of the psalm presents to us Jesus as the king. Jesus as the king. Some of you have been on uh, boards, city council, school boards, the like. And when it's time for important business to be discussed, often there's such a thing as executive session. And when you go into executive session, you can't talk outside of executive session about what went on in executive session. Psalm 110 verse 1 gives us a glimpse into the executive session between God the Father and God the Son. The Lord said to my Lord. Now how many in your text notice that the word, the first reference to Lord is in all capitals? Do you see that there? The Lord said to my Lord. It's in all capitals. It is in most all translations. Anytime in the Old Testament, the word Lord is in all capitals, it means Jehovah. Jehovah or Yahweh is another transliteration of that. Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord, that references God the Father. And then the second Lord is in lowercase, capital L, lowercase, The Lord said to my Lord. That's the word for Adonai. Means Lord or boss or master. God the Father said to God the Son. We're getting a glimpse into the executive session that takes place between the Trinity. I'll give you another example of when we were led into the executive session. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image. Why would that be plural there? Because there's a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we get that glimpse here. God the Father says to God the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now the word said, if you mark in your Bibles at all, you might underline that word said. Because that's a very strong word. That's not like you and I, uh, you know, having a little hot chocolate at the coffee shop or something. We're having a little conversation. Because if it's you and I, I'm not having coffee, but one, maybe you are. That's, it's stronger than that. This is like, you might hear on the news, yesterday the Supreme Court said that such and such is now the law of the land. That word said isn't used very often in the Bible, but when it's used, it's God talking. It's an announcement. It carries power and weight. It's an oracle. It's a declaration. The Lord said to the Son. So what was this declaration? Sit at my right hand. Sit at my right hand. It was some months ago, Jacob preached and he talked about, uh, he kind of talked about riding shotgun. Everybody wants to ride shotgun with their dad. And when kids are, speaking of church vans going to camp, they're all eager. Shotgun is right. Somebody calls that with shotgun. It's not till next Friday when we leave on the trip, but people are calling uh, shotgun and such. Sit at my right hand. So the reference to right hand, God the Father saying Jesus Christ is in this place of honor And he's in this place of authority. 
It's the equivalent of the throne itself, that Jesus Christ is in this equivalent place. And then he has the word sit there. I want you to sit here like your work is done. You have finished the work of salvation. When Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. He was saying the work of salvation is done. Have a seat. Jesus is always pictured sitting at the right hand of God except for one time. I'm going to leave that for you to investigate. And if, you can, if you're super curious, you can ask me. There's only one time Jesus is pictured standing at the right hand of God. All other times, he's sitting because his work is done. So sit there. And then look at the end of the verse. Until I make your enemies your footstool. God is telling, the Father is telling the Son, there will come a day of humiliation for your enemies. Those who are defying you, there will come a day. Now, how many look out across the geopolitical landscape of the world and you say, how does that guy in North Korea get another breath from God? How does the slave labor environment of China how does that guy get another breath? It says in verse 6 that he will judge the nations and he'll fill the places with dead bodies and he'll execute the heads of the countries. So there will come a day when the enemies will be humiliated. In that verse, it says the Lord Jehovah will send out a rod of strength out of Zion. The thing is, we're not there yet. There's a word in verse 1, another one for you to mark or circle, and it's the word until. Sit here at my right hand until it's time for you to take your rightful place as the king of the world. Now, some of you, your faith is wavered because you're in the until. And it seems like the bad guys are getting away with stuff. And it seems like things are happening that you didn't ask for and you didn't bargain for and you didn't buy into. And why does this keep happening to you? And why is this circumstance going on? And how are they still getting away with it? Psalm 73 is one of my favorite psalms. And he says in there, I know God's good, but I'm drowning. I'm overwhelmed. They're getting away with it. And then he comes to a point in that psalm where he says, then I went into the house of the Lord and I realized their end. In Revelation chapter 6 uh, there's some believers who are being persecuted. And it's overwhelming them. We think of the book of Revelation and the judgments that take place there. And there's some believers that become believers after the rapture of the church. And they're crying out to God in verse 10. How long is this going to go on? And they actually say this. How long, how much longer do we have to suffer? There it is on the screen. They cried out, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? You ever ask that question? How long do I have to wait for this, God? This is totally unfair. I got robbed. I got ripped off. This is so wrong. How long do I have to wait? For justice. You said you're the God of justice. I've prayed and I've waited. I've tried to release them and forgive them. Verse 11 goes on in Revelation 6. Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them they should rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. God said, it's almost time. 
just a little bit longer. There's a little bit more suffering going to go on. But it's almost over. Notice the white robe part there in verse 11. Go back with me now to Psalm 110, verse 3. Your people shall be volunteers. They're not mercenaries. They're not selfish people or doing it for whatever they get out of it. In the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness. God says to those that are suffering, there will be a reward. I I got a white robe for you. You're going to arrive there pure in my eyes. I love this gathering of people. It's The church we're talking about, it describes this Messiah gathering a group of people, a group of believers. And in that beauty of holiness, he looks at you and he says, I see a forgiven saint. I see a saint. I see a saint. When you read through the New Testament, 1 Corinthians was a church with a lot of problems. And he says, I've called you to be saints. And he says over and over, I've called you to be saints. I've called you to be saints. I'm clothing you in white robe. You've got garments of beauty about you. You see, God is renewing and refreshing. God is forgiving, restoring. Every day his mercies are new and every day is a fresh start. Christ is king. And we would do well, we would be wise to align our lives with that reality. Verse 4 is another verse that's quoted often in the New Testament. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So here we have Christ as priest, Christ as high priest. He was king early in the chapter, now he's high priest. And there's a divine oath here. The Lord has sworn. Now when God says something, We should take that at face value. But if God swears an oath, that's taking it to another level. If you were to testify in court, they would ask you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? People have sworn affidavits. People have sworn in depositions and other hearings. When you go into the military, you raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And it goes on. So when it says God swore an oath, now, why would it take something on that level? God, it's kind of getting melodramatic here, don't you think? Like you swear an oath, God, why don't you just tell us and then we're all going to believe it and just go on about our business. Why why all this oath business? And here would be the answer to that. The installation of Jesus Christ as high priest meant the elimination of the Jewish priesthood system. There was no more a need for a priest to represent God's people to God. We now have direct access. We don't have to go through a priest to get forgiveness of sins. We don't have to pray through a saint to have uh, super great access to God. The Jewish priestly order was over and it became about Christ. He is our mediator. We go through Christ. Now at the cross of Christ, a couple of interesting things happened. One of those was at some moment in that six hour crucifixion, There was some lightning and earth shook and the veil at the temple was torn from top to bottom, a tremendously thick veil, three or four inches thick, like 60 feet high. And the veil was torn from top to bottom. It's in Matthew 27 and verse 50 where this is described for us. And it says there, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. This is Christ on the cross. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn from two, in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rock split. Just this amazing, crazy scene. But the veil was between where the regular people could be and where God was. And when the veil was torn away, it meant all of us regular people can have direct access to God. 
But something else happened a few hours earlier than that that's also had more meaning than the individual involved thought it would. Before the crucifixion, Jesus was interrogated and questioned and he was brought before various trial Pilate. We did a, a, a fascinating series on Jesus' interactions with Pilate. But one of his other conversations was with a guy named Caiaphas, the high priest. And Caiaphas is asking him, are you claiming to be the Messiah? Are you claiming to be God? And he would say yes to those things. And the high priest just got all worked up. And it's in Matthew 26 is where that high priest experience is. And it says there in Matthew 26, it's in verses 65 and 66, that the high priest, he tore his clothes and he said, he's spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have any witnesses? Look now, you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all were like, he's deserving of death. And that led into the crucify him thing. But that tearing of the clothes, he was just trying to get the crowd stirred up. Like he's claiming to be God. Now God was operating on another level. He was letting everybody know through that crucifixion of Christ that the entire priestly system that the Jews had was being torn apart. It wasn't just that high priest clothes that were being ripped apart. It was the entire Jewish system that wasn't necessary anymore because Christ became our high priest. He had no idea what he, and he was tearing his clothes for effect, what he was getting at. Christ is our high priest. That also reminds me, a note we would add, when we, uh, Jesus said to pray in my name, when we close a prayer in Jesus' name, we're saying he's our priest. He's our go-between. We're not entitled. We're not deserving. None of it's coming to us. We're not asking for it because of our good looks or our good works. We're asking for it based on who Jesus Christ is. We come in Jesus' name. Back in Psalm 110, the father says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Interestingly, the, in the Jewish system, the priests would serve for 20 years. They would turn 30. They would you know, get their shot at it. And when they were 50, they were done. They went into whatever semi-retirement looked like for them. David, who wrote the Psalm, he was king for 40 years. So if the Priests served for 20. David was king for 40. He saw every position turn over at least twice. So he saw him come and go, come and go, come and go. And then he gets this word from God that Jesus Christ is our priest who will never change. Have you ever dealt with a business and you're like, I, you're satisfied with the person on the other end of the phone or maybe at the, the, the business establishment? And then you go there and you're like, hey, I'm looking for, uh, you know, Joe. Joe's the guy I always deal with. It. Joe's not here anymore. Well, how about Tom? He was the last person. No, Tom, not here anymore. Well, every time I come, it's somebody different. There's a, a website that I access at least once a month. Every time I get in there, it says your password doesn't work. I have to change my password every single time I access that website. What David said was, this priest, this password, this access is good forever. It's not going to be like, well, I haven't accessed it in a while. See if this password's still good. It's not like, well, I haven't been to that business in a while. What's the name of that person? I got it in my contact somewhere. He's always going to be there. He's never going to run out. He's not going to get tired. It's an endless life. And third, the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek's an interesting uh, individual. Hebrews chapter 7, we would have done a, a message on Melchizedek some months ago. Melchizedek was different than the a Jewish priestly order. There's no mention of his family background. There's no mention of his nationality. He's the king of Salem, the king of peace, the king of Jerusalem, and also a, a 
priest. And he's only mentioned three times in the Bible. I'll give you those if you want to fill in your blanks. Genesis 14, he's mentioned historically there. That's the first occurrence of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, where we're looking at, that's prophetic. He's mentioned prophetically because it's looking forward to who the Messiah will be, Jesus Christ. And then Hebrews 7, the entire chapter, explains the significance of Melchizedek. He's mentioned to us doctrinally there. It's all given to us. Let me offer three final thoughts. Since Jesus Christ is king, we should submit to his lordship willingly. If he is king, since he's king, when we submit to his authority and his lordship in our lives, we are aligning our lives with reality. Since he's priest, we would be wise to come to him eagerly. He doesn't want to us to avoid him because of our sin, come to him eagerly, willingly. And then, because he's judge, there will be a day for those who are defiant. We should avoid, avoid his judgment fearfully. Do everything we can to avoid that judgment. And seek after him and submit to his authority. Would you stand with me, please, with your heads bowed and eyes closed? Oh, to have a faith that perseveres. As our worship team comes to close us out with a final song. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want us to think there's some that have been afraid to come to God. Like, man, he's going to blast me. He's going to get me because of that thing that happened back there or those, that 20-year run where I was pretty you know, messed up. He longs for us to come to him. He longs for us to. And then, because he is Lord, why would we make ourselves boss? When we look out at our culture where everybody's trying to be their own boss, all we see is loneliness. All we see is self-absorbed desperation. God in heaven, may we look to you. May we align our lives with the reality that you are the boss and the Lord. May we not live in fear and distance from you. You have fresh mercy every day, as fresh as the dew on the ground was this morning in the humidity. May we do all we can to avoid your judgment, Father. Would you change a hundred hearts this morning? you change a thousand hearts this morning in this county and beyond. In Jesus' name.